Great. Well. Yeah. Might as well get her going. Um, so I'd like to call this uh, July 27th Environment Committee meeting uh, to order. And uh, welcome everybody. And first I'd like to acknowledge that we're meeting on the traditional territories of the name of First Nation. And our first order of business is the adoption of the agenda. It's moved by Councillor Bonner, seconded by Jerome. Uh, all in favor? Agenda carried. And uh, adoption of the minutes for the May 25th um, meeting. Moved by. Don, seconded by Chair. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, all in favor? <laughs> Carried. Bring us to number five uh, presentations corporate green building and corporate green building energy management policies. Okay, so with great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Jen McGaskill, who's our manager of facilities. And asset planning. And I think, Jen, this is your first time presenting the environment committee. It is. Yes. So, Jen works very closely with Ting. And while Jen is on the corporate side, Ting is on the community side. And as part of your work plan, um, we promised you an update on corporate energy and facilities management. And with that, I will let Jen take it away. Thank you. Yeah, it, basically, what we're here for one of the items on your work plan this year was to review the uh, green building policy as well as the energy conservation and management policy. Both of these policies are specifically for our corporate buildings, our corporate infrastructure, not community-based emissions. So um, looking to present a review of <clears throat> progress to date, where we've gotten to, um, some of the complexities around these policies and the considerations thereof, and timelines for our next steps and when we'll be back to see you again. So overview, um, the green building strategy is currently based in LEED, which is proprietary um, program. It is points based. You do design items and those result in points. A certain number of points gets you different status within LEED. There are various forms of LEED. You can have design and construction. You can have operations and maintenance. And our policy currently is not specific to any of those um, nuances of LEED, but simply to a LEED standard. It applies to new buildings as well as significant renovations. So if we were to add a wing to a building, we would be looking for a LEED standard as well as um, there, there's, the, there's the opportunity or option to get an exemption um, from a new building if we were to go to council and request it with whatever the reason may be that we are seeking that exemption. So that's for new buildings. Um, then for existing buildings... Can we, can we ask questions as we go or should we wait till after? Let's go with as we go. Okay. Um, with the LEADS policy, uh, there was, I think maybe with the um, fire station. Yes. Uh, there was an exemption that was requested from us. Correct. And I'm curious in terms of sort of the paperwork around leads and that there was just, there was some, it seemed like it just was the additional costs and the additional administration around it, it at the end of the day, it didn't feel like it was worth it. And I was curious, is that something that will be, a is it a, re a recurrent sort of theme or is that sort of just specifically with that project and as a policy kind of, Lead in general is quite paperwork heavy, yeah. and in most of the proprietary certifications, you know, Passive House, Bama Group, Bill yeah. Green, like they all have a component that is verified that you have done what you said you were going to do. Mm -hmm. Here's all the paperwork to go with it. Submit it for your certification. Right. So in every one of those, if you're going to have a a proprietary certification, there's a level of administration that has to go with it mm -hmm. because you are essentially um, auditing the mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. Some people then say that as long as you have that auditing process, it holds you to account mm -hmm. that you're not going to value engineer a certain item out of a project because that was just the sustainable approach. 
um, and that's our budget, and we have to stick to our budget. The trouble is, is that on the, on the flip side of that is you do sometimes end up putting in things that wouldn't necessarily have gone in. Mm -hmm. A good example being um, you have a polished concrete floor, but you will get a point if you use low VOC carpet. Mm -hmm. You wanted polished concrete floor, you were happy with that, but you need one more point. So then you've put in something else, essentially consuming more resources. Is that really sustainable because you got your point? Mm -hmm. There, the, the debate starts kind of at that location. Right, okay. So one of the, uh, maybe the downsides to proprietary processes like this is you do end up going through a checklist, filling in all the paperwork to go with, which comes with a cost to then have something that spits out at the end that at the moment of occupancy, you are now certified. Mm -hmm. You then have to maintain that through mm -hmm. renewal work or fully understanding the operations of that building to keep that that um, sustainable mm -hmm. kind of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. You're welcome. So that's the existing, sorry, the, the new buildings. Then we have an energy conservation and management policy, which is primarily for our existing building stock. We have um, over a hundred existing facilities that all have various pieces of infrastructure that need renewals on a cyclical basis. And th this policy is geared towards um, considering reduction in energy use, be it natural gas, be it electricity. Um, there's a portion of this that is um, behavior programs like um, uh, an anti-idling program for our fleet vehicles, um, automation and turning off lights just as you and, uh, leave rooms, simple things that we can all do that just is, is a behavior consideration, limited costs associated, but can be some significant benefits. And then there's a portion of this policy that also considers the payback time frame, and it currently is a simple payback of eight years. There is um, a portion of the policy that allows for a more complex life cycle uh, assessment if there is, uh, if the complexity of the renewal warrants such a thing. So in the case of maybe a, a lighting renewal, will replace existing incandescent bulbs with LEDs. Yes, it'll pay us back in seven years. Excellent, off we go. Maybe we're looking at something more involved like a mechanical system. It's gonna have a, a longer payback period maybe, but it also has a longer life cycle. So we get to consider both of those items as we're looking at renewals of individual pieces of infrastructure within our facilities. So you're likely aware Nanaimo has some pretty ambitious targets with respect to climate action, um, mainly around carbon reduction. This graphic is from Reimagine, thank you Lisa and team. 50% um, reduction by 2030 and 100% reduction of our carbon emissions by 2050. And these are um, for the community and as I noted at the beginning, our policies are specifically for corporate buildings, but obviously as part of the community, it's an opportunity for us to be leaders in uh, these implementing these targets so that we can sort of set the stage for others to participate in, in our climate action. With new buildings, so our green building policy, there is significant opportunity to capitalize on our increased understanding of technologies available, opportunities to lay out buildings in a sustainable manner, maximize our, do I need to do something with that? Sure. Sorry. I can do that. Oh, sorry. We can ma maximize our daylighting so that we're reducing how often or um, how much our lighting needs to be on. We can change the opacity of walls to reduce how much heating and cooling we're gonna need, all sorts of opportunities with our new buildings that it's, it's far more cost effective and with a, a longer uh, opportunity to implement energy and emission reduction initiatives with our new construction. So the green building policy portion of this, the new buildings, becomes a, an absolutely fantastic way that we can set a 
uh, a stage for the community and, and show our initiation in this sector. So one of the things that staff have discussed is possibly accelerating what we're hearing from the province with respect to the next building code and the 2030 goals. So there's a piece of that that is uh, GHG intensity per um, GHG intensity for buildings, so new buildings having essentially a carbon budget that they can use. There is currently talk about embodied carbon and those considerations that go into new infrastructure. And there is um, all sorts of then opportunities to cherry pick appropriate sustainable initiatives within the specific facility. So if we have a facility that really needs to have specific air considerations. Maybe it's the museum and we need to manage the humidity. We can, we can target that specific need in the facility with a sustainable system. So there's, there's a lot more opportunity to get the right people at the table early on and maximize our sustainability initiatives within new construction. And that's the, within provincial uh, legislation or that's like within our corporate policies currently currently it's not within our corporate policies okay. it's being considered the one of the struggles that we're having right now is that the climate conversation is quite quick there's a lot of information it's very complex and a lot of it is is moving very quickly so the province and the federal government are all looking towards 2030 as the next timeline we have a corresponding target for 2030 for our emission reductions, which then would, and any building that we have in service now is going to be in service, or that we build now, sorry, is going to be in service in 2030. So it simply makes sense to look towards what are those goals in 2030, implement them now, and essentially be ahead of the curve so we're not looking at retrofits in 10, 12 years when we're really under the crunch to move towards our 2050 targets. Mm -hmm. And then, through the chair, building on this, the next presentation by Dave Stewart will speak a little bit about mm -hmm. our approach towards advancing those mm -hmm. requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. And is it our intention here that we're that new buildings are carbon neutral going forward? It's one of the things we're, we're talking about. The province is signaling that. So this is, a, again, either an, an opportunity to say we're going to do that now, or maybe there's some significant implications. I'll get to this a little bit later. But one of the things that we're looking at is the interconnectedness of these sorts of initiatives. And if Reimagine has shown me anything, it's that we are so interconnected with everything that we do that making sure that we're considering if we make a decision here, there's an impact that ripples through the organization in general and then out to the community. So ensuring that we have considered all of that and are really targeting our resourcing where it's going to be most effective. So for existing buildings, this process is significantly more complicated. Um, we're looking at trying to retrofit existing systems. In some cases, these systems are um, at the end of their service expectations and we need to be replacing them regardless. We're then faced with the decision of, do we replace like for like? Do we consider uh, opportunities for increased efficiency? what is the capacity of the existing systems if we're a, a lot of the decarbonization initiatives are based in electrification just simply because of the cleanliness of our grid but that has an extra level that goes with it so we have um, existing electrical service to our facilities and that has a finite amount so if, if we then need to draw more power to put in our electrified system we then run the risk of um, or not run the risk, but there's, there's a cost associated with that if BC Hydro then needs to pull a new service to the building, do a design, maybe there's no grid capacity, there's extra steps that need to happen. Not insurmountable, but just an extra complexity to what's happening with existing facilities. If we were to eliminate our use of natural gas, 43% of our total energy, would that bring us down to our goals? Seems like very low hanging fruit. If, if we removed 
are... If we went from natural gas to electricity and took out 43% of our total energy uses and put it, turned that into electricity, would that lower our, would we meet our goals? We would well exceed our goals. That is not low hanging fruit though. I say that because 18,000 megawatts of energy is a substantial amount of energy. That is, I, sorry, I, I did some math before and I can't recall it. That's um, an, an average home uses 11,000 kilowatts of energy and then you have gigawatts of energy and then you have mega, sorry, megawatts, then gigawatts. So uh, 18 million kilowatts for 11,000 kilowatts per hour. Sorry, no, it's, it's, it seems like low hanging fruit, but that is, that is a huge implication. Um, and, and if I advance a bit, I'll, I'll show you some of the complexities we're, we're working with. So this is an example that came up recently at one of our fire halls. We have a, an opportunity, we've got an existing gas-fired rooftop unit, and there's the opportunity to convert that to an electric heat pump. Great opportunity, we can decarbonize that particular piece of equipment, and then um, move towards our goals. So one of the questions we just talked about, what is the electrical capacity of the service coming to the building currently? If there is enough capacity, great, we can use it to implement this heat pump. Um, in the case of one fire hall, we have capacity, excellent, off we go. In the case of the other, the other fire hall, we didn't have capacity. So now that $15,000 heat pump becomes a, do we have a $15,000 service upgrade so that we can then implement a heat pump at the the fire hall and maybe we do and that's where it becomes a a complex decision matrix essentially to ensure that we're not just putting all of our our money into single facilities at single decision points but that we are considering all of our opportunities so maybe some of that 18,000 megawatts of power can be it, that fire hall makes up some of that but maybe there's somewhere else that we can get a better return on that investment and still reduce our corporate emissions by the same or more in a different uh, in a different What's facility. the most effective deployment of resources? I mean, there's a exactly. decision about not changing out some of the stuff in the pool or whatever, the, the thing, because yeah. mm -hmm. the amount that we reduce the GHGs by whatever the, I think it was like the overhead, whatever, yeah, we, we, we were could at seven percent. We could deploy that money somewhere else and get more yeah. going through, and though that, that is hard decision making and, and great. And, and it's the sort of thing that we have to consider. So going back to the fire hall, that there is capacity. All of our fire halls have emergency backup generators. So in the event of a power outage, maybe it's the middle of winter. Well, do we need heat at that building? If it was gas fired, we would have heat. Okay, so now we have to upsize that emergency generator to ensure that there's enough capacity to run the entire facility, or we accept that in the event of a power outage, there isn't going to be that heating capacity for that facility. And these are all decision points that need to be made because it's not a one size fits all. It really depends on the facility and the services being offered and what, what the expectations are for that facility. Yeah. I see where you're coming from, and I appreciate it. Yeah. To me, the whole thing has to be changed. So whether or not you change this one or you change this one, doesn't matter because they both have to be changed. Agreed. Yeah, so okay. I'm going on that assumption. Yeah. Okay. So right across the board, we have to stop burning gas. Right? That's a thing. Um, so if we, if we, regardless, I, I get your point where you're saying, like, if we spend 30, you know, $3 million of upgrading this thing, can that $3 million be used over here to do something else? Except for the fact is, you still got a building that's bringing natural gas, and that's the part we need to change, regardless of how much. 
And in my head, I have kind of considered it as you are a farmer in the orchard, you have a six foot ladder, you go around and collect all the fruit that you can get with a six foot ladder, and then we go back to the barn and we get a 12 foot ladder, and we come back and we collect all the fruit that we can get with a 12 foot ladder, and kind of work our way up, because the first ton of carbon is the easiest and the cheapest, and the last is the most expensive in the harvest. So I completely agree that as we move towards 2050 and 100% decarbonization, we have to get there, but there are a lot of steps between now and there, and there's a lot of budget considerations to go with that. One of the things that the overall portfolio is working with is that we have um, budgeted like for like, and there are some funding constraints with our resources available now to maintain our portfolio as it is. So when we start adding this extra layer of sustainability that must be considered, that there's no question in my mind that's needed, we do need to then look at the resources that are needed to do that and then make a priority decision within the overall organization and the community for some of those, those pieces. Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that is a, a necessary practical orientation that must be undertaken. And I think figuring out a policy, like I would say that because we're in transition, I would say that organizational inertia probably still would tend to be like, oh, that might be a little bit too expensive, or if we do that, we might be able to do that. And I think the trust to, to, to counter that organizational inertia is if there's a larger strategy that you can say, okay, we are saving this money here because it's going to be deployed here. Yes. Because like, like say for that, for that decision about uh, what you voted in favor for, uh, was uh, with not replacing those elements in the pool was because, okay, we, we're probably not getting our best money for our, our buck. We could reduce more emissions by deploying here. It's like, that's good. But in the absence of what is the larger strategy and where are we going to deploy it? It's like, well, is that really going to happen or will it, that money just kind of disappear into a, a, another set of values that are, are still managing? And I think that would having a strategy in place and sort of like a policy that delineates what are our priorities in deployment of resources. And when we come into those situations where it goes, would help ease the concern that maybe older inertia won't be sort of co-opting, sort of really continually pushing that. Yeah. yeah. So is there a, an overall circular matrix, but have you got like a basically an asset management plan where you know that this building is at the end of its life cycle in five years, ten years, and the easy upgrades at X, Y, Z? And because in terms of decision making, if you have that mapped out, it's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> Otherwise, it becomes a case per case per case. It's hard to do. A, one of one of the, the six foot ladder approach is difficult yeah. if you don't have it mapped out. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that the group that I work with, the facility asset management group, is tasked with is putting together a facility asset plan. Right. And we are working through our facilities and getting those 30, 30 year projections, mm -hmm. which is one of the things that is highlighting the, um, the budget shortfalls. Right. Because we now have a much better understanding of the assets and the infrastructure that we have in place. And so it's highlighting not only the the funding challenges, but also the opportunities that we have that we can say, well, we have this many rooftop units that are burning gas, we have right. this many whatever, and exactly feed into that plan that where are we going next? Right. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it is difficult too because you can't project like how much money could be available from the province for the additional things. Mm -hmm. You know, how well is carbon priced, and and what are by not doing it, what are the potential costs of the opportunities you're missing out by not you know, changing over the fire department now yeah. because of cost escalations and like, it's so complex, I don't know how the hell you figure that out, but that's, you know. <laughs> but it allows you to do it the opposite, which is when there's a pile of money that comes down. Yeah. You're ready to strike and say, yeah. okay, well, we've got 10 rooftop units ready to roll for these 10 buildings yeah. and it's in the plan because that's how we planned it, right? So. Yeah. And, and that was the opportunity that came up at NAC. There was a grant yeah. announcement. We were able to move quickly enough to get a consultant to put together the report that was needed to then say, if we put this money towards the pool, right. we can get 70% emission reduction. And if we were to spend the same amount, double double our investment, we could get that last, we could get the last 15%. Right. 
or we can take that money and put it in our other pool yeah. and do an, another 70% of our overall portfolio emissions. Mm -hmm. So those are the exact opportunities that we're looking for as mm -hmm. a group of people. We work closely with the operations folks and find out you know, what units are they keeping an eye on? Okay, what can we as a planning group get in front of so that we can have those shovel-ready considerations? Look at the capacity is coming in. Okay, we're all ready to go. We can electrify this particular mm -hmm. project. Cool. So we've kind of talked about all of this. We've, we've got the opportunity to maximize our return on our investments, um, GHG reduction, energy efficiencies, when we do a tailored approach project by project. And it's part of the conversation that happens with each renewal is what are we looking at doing? What are our goals? Where is this facility going to be in 10 years? Um, what is its criticality to our delivery of service? All sorts of opportunities to really check our investments to get the best return. Um, so timeline is we are working through this, obviously super complex considerations. And one of the, the big questions that we need to have answered is a gap analysis, is if we were to take that 18,000 megawatts of, of um, equivalent gas consumption and turn it into electricity, what's that going to cost us? So if we have that other side of the spectrum, we kind of know our, our range of what we're working with. We also need to make sure that we understand the impl implications to the other departments within the organization. Um, there are a number of priorities across the organization and they all need to be considered in conjunction with one another, making sure that we're, that, that a policy isn't going to dictate or cause a lost opportunity because of being confined by the language or the restrictive nature or whatever it might be. So that is planned for um, the next six months. And then including gathering those pieces and then having those workshops with internal stakeholders to consider um, all of those intricacies and, and interdependence. We've got um, the asset management update happening right now that is providing a, a really great opportunity to see kind of the overall um, condition of the portfolio, where those opportunities might exist through natural renewal cycles and um, opportunity to capitalize on those investments, which then has us drafting policies Q4 2023 and uh, review Q1 2024, returning to the committee in Q2 2024. Kind of our overall process for this is a, a bit of ready, fire, aim. Because if we don't do anything, we, or if we don't plan to do nothing, or wait till we have all the information, we won't get where we need to get to. Absolutely. Um, so you're ready to electrify again. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Would ever a situation come up where a, a natural gas piece of equipment is failing, that you would replace it with another natural gas piece of equipment and therefore extend its life considerably? Yes. Uh, I can think of a, a specific example. Um, at the Nanaimo Aquatic Center. We are currently looking at a makeup air unit. It uh, has electric fan, electric cooling, and gas heating. It services a mechanical space that generally does not need any heating. It's below ground, mechanical systems in place provide sufficient ambient heating that the unit very rarely actually provides heating. If we were to electrify that unit, we would have to do considerable modifications to the, the curb that the unit sits on. We would have to, um, we, we would have to do a, a service, potentially service upgrade, just because of the capacity of the, system, the existing electrical feed. Um, and there would be very little return on that investment because the unit doesn't use much gas at all to start with. So it was, a calculated decision to maximize where we need to, where we can reduce our, our emissions through lesser consumption, 
but that unit specifically, it very rarely uses gas anyway. For example, we're doing three units at the, at the same time. The two other units are being converted to electric heat pumps with electric backup. So why not just not even install it at all? Just say, okay, this place doesn't get heat anymore. Because it needs cooling and ventilation. So, oh, so you mean like don't install the heating coil to provide any heat at all? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I would need to check with consultants as to whether we could remove that capacity. There, there's a risk associated with that. I, I get that. And I'm just throwing yeah. another coat. Um, it's, it's just like if it doesn't need to, if it only gets used once in a while mm -hmm. and it's there, it'll get used. If it's, if it's just a question on January 2nd of each year, they have to go down there and check something and it's really cold, as long as nothing's freezing and breaking. Well, the, this, that, the system is automated, so it's not a matter of somebody choosing to turn on a unit. So it would be um, a, a thermostat saying, this space is demanding some heating due to extreme cold, whatever it might be, then that's when the unit would provide that heating. So there would be a risk of a mechanical space. There is plumbing fixtures down there. Um, it's the, the all, all of the, basically the guts of the pool is, is in that space. So if there were to be a, a pipe freeze, it would be a catastrophic type failure. So not, I mean, again, this is, this is where we weigh the risks associated with each thing. Um, we did not consider not putting the heating, that, that heating coil in. Um, we're, we're seeing less and less need for um, cool, or sorry, heating degree days. We've got more cooling degree, so the, the demand is going to be lower. And I guess it could have, it could have been considered, but it, it wasn't. Yeah, and the reason I'm, the thing I'm, I'm looking at these things, engineer says, okay, this is a room, it has this size, this size, it needs this much cooling, this much heating, here's your plans, go at it, right? Instead of saying, well, if we didn't heat it, you know, and we bring in like a, you know, an incandescent light bulb, and that's enough, right? Mm -hmm. Which we do at the barns all the time. Um, so it, it's, it's just this, sometimes there's, yeah, this is how it has to be because this is the way it's on paper. And, and these are the requirements, and we're putting equipment in that we don't need necessarily. Yeah, I, I see. I see the. I see the intent. My concern would be that we're talking about obviously far more complex systems than um, a, a spigot in a barn and a incandescent light. I, you know, I've heard people doing that in pump houses, and mm -hmm, you know, yeah. saying a really ineff uh, inefficient or e efficient way to make sure that you have just enough heating to keep the the cool off. Um, in, in the case of a um, automated building that has a control system that is all very carefully managed to ensure proper air conditions and, and um, considering uh, temperatures and humidities and, and all that stuff, there would, there would be an added level of, of risk associated with the overall facility not functioning if that space was in condition. That's why I said we, we would need to look into whether that would be a, a viable solution. Um, in this case, it was a we have a budget for a like for like replacement, and it is it is not increasing our carbon footprint. In fact, it is something that is negligibly impacting our carbon footprint. So we'll we'll go the, the like for like, leave it as is. If it is needed, the automation system would turn it on to service that space and we would avoid the risk of a frozen. So do you have, much like the asset management matrix, do you have a power consumer energy consumption list? Like what's the most energy hungry facility in the city? We, we do, we have 11 of our larger facilities are connected to a utility monitoring yeah. system. And the Nanaimo Aquatic Center is the largest consuming. A second to that is bed and pool. Right. Pools are obviously extremely um, power or <laughs> energy intensive buildings. And so those are the, the two that we're really focusing on in terms of opportunities for reduction. But it doesn't mean that we can't do more as each individual facility comes up. I have a question. Just not a little bit. Sure. Any, anybody up in space there got any questions? Nope. Go ahead, Don. Okay. 
one more kick at the dead horse here. Uh -oh. um, the, do, when we're looking at these facilities, I know what, what, where, where you're coming from in terms of the infrastructure. Is there another option here? Is Because I, I know from what I've been told before that our facilities, our pool facilities, are open way more than just about every other place in the province. And, and we go to a great length, of, and, that, and, and people in our community appreciate that. But there, is there a question that if we didn't open it on this day, this day, and this day, we would reduce our carbon footprint by this much, and therefore that's worth doing? Like, it does, is that type of uh, everything considered? Aid? The the consideration with pools specifically, we have a very large mass of water that is part. Like, that's the, the biggest contributor. So. In the case of, say, a shutdown and we drain the pool, it takes a week to reheat that pool. Mm -hmm. So if we were to um, say we're not going to be open on Monday, Wednesday, then you would the you would still be running all the systems to maintain all the, the environmental controls specifically of the pool, which is the biggest contributor. So you wouldn't save anything there. You would get, you know, operationally lights are turned off or computer systems aren't running, those sorts of things. But the biggest consumption is going to be the maintaining of the temperature of the water. So very similar to the um, old, the old adage of you turn the heat down at night and then you turn it back up. There's a demand that happens as a result of that. And the current thinking is that with technology now, you're better off to maintain a set point and keep it at that, rather than doing a cyclical warming and cooling. Because it, the, the demand that results of, we need heating now, we need hot water now, results in fire up all the boilers, push out a bunch of hot water, okay, we're all set now, we just trickle it through, as opposed to just maintaining a consistent set point. So it would have to be a long period of shutdown in order to, which I, I don't think is, you know, the community quite enjoys our facilities, and, and it would be a programming conversation. <laughs> Um, with the policy, uh, is this policy update specifically for corporate uh, retrofits, like uh, updates, or is it will this include for new builds as well? The green building policy is for new builds, mm -hmm. and the energy conservation and management policy is for um, existing infrastructure. Okay, and both uh, policies are being updated. Correct. And is the timeline for both policies to have them completed by Q2 2024? Correct. Okay. Um, now, say like coming online, we've got like the police station, the the corporate knock. Yep. The the operations operation center. center. We've got uh, maybe the south end center. Mm -hmm. Would this timeline for new buildings capture those buildings? Those buildings are already in conversation. Yeah. And these are all conversations already happening. So um, I, I would say that it just would underpin a, a decision point. So it wouldn't, it would depend on how quickly those projects progress. Each one of those projects is in a different phase at present. Mm -hmm. So uh, the operations center is more developed, say, than the South End Wellness Center. Mm -hmm. So more opportunity for more discussion at the Wellness Center there hasn't been enough um, design work yet done that this couldn't be all implemented at the operations center. Right. So the conversations, the knowledge base is there, yeah. and there's the appropriate people are currently at the table having the conversations. Yeah. It, it becomes part of the, um, the prioritization within budgets allocated and, and considerations and priorities. Right. So there are conversations around having these targets in the design, you know, with the intention in the design of these buildings that are coming online, but they're, depending on when the policy comes in and how far along those projects are will be to what degree those projects would be meeting certain standards. Jump in, Jen. Would you say that the policy is the baseline? Um, Absolutely. Right. And so yeah. we have the ability and other supporting groups we imagine to step it up, even if the policy has been updated. Yeah. But that I, I don't know if that yeah. addresses your question. Uh, what what I, I guess my question is is that 
do we have the policies in place now or the policies that we're going to be updating to ensure that those buildings right now that are in stream or starting to be on stream that haven't really been approved thus far are, are starting to take into account these design considerations now because they are probably the biggest buildings that we're going to be doing in the next little while are going to be here forever and that it would be a crime shame that they're not dealt right. with in that way. Yeah, um, so the the green building policy currently in effect is a lead based okay. policy yeah. and that it would have to, any new buildings would have to follow that unless yeah. it has a council exemption. Yeah. Um, there is acknowledgement that 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 there are other strategies available mm -hmm. that are probably more appropriate mm -hmm. and in line with our targets. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess it would be if the policy isn't approved, is there the possibility that we wouldn't implement a, a minimum standard? Is that where you're coming from? Because all of this is, is tied into provincially mandated code changes. Yeah. So the other piece to go with this is when the next code update comes, what is it picking up? What is going to be incoming um, provincial regulations or recommendations? And I, I think there's enough conversation around these topics that there's automatically going to be consideration yeah. regardless of whether there's an adopted policy or not. Mm -hmm. um, having that adopted policy in place obviously would give a much firmer line in the sand, mm -hmm. thou shalt not go below this. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I guess I, I would like to think that the right people are at the conversation table already mm -hmm. having these conversations. Mm -hmm. So policy or not, we're, we're talking about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I guess I would hope, but yeah. obviously no guarantee. Okay. And um, just in terms of the timeline for the policy update for Q2 2024, in terms of, I mean, it sounds like the somewhat complex considerations that need to be taken to, into account. Um, is that timeline sort of like, uh, is that pushing it or is it like, what are there other things impinging on uh, that timeline? Yes. Like a year and a half, I guess, seems like quite a it, long it's, time. It yeah. seems like a long time, and, and I was I was thinking about that as I was putting yeah. that together. Um, the the difficulty is, or, or maybe not even the opportunity is, is that there are a lot of other considerations. So we just got reimagined feedback, which was fantastic to mm -hmm. sort of check in with the community. Where are other people at with, with the considerations? Mm -hmm and an opportunity to roll that into what we're doing with our policy. We've got the facility asset management um, strategy. Mm -hmm. We've got the asset management update and the condition of our portfolio. What does, what does um, sustainability mean for an existing portfolio if the portfolio needs a certain size investment and that investment is actually going to be three times the size if we're then taking a sustainability approach. So there's quite a few um, fundamental foundations that are needed so that we can make sure that we're not missing on an opportunity by putting in a policy that isn't underpinned by a lot of other basic information as to where we're at with our portfolio. Mm -hmm. I mean, we could move the two forward Differently, the, the existing building is absolutely the most complex. Mm -hmm. the, the green building strategy is more so a, what is our general um, appetite for implementing this? There's the cost associated, what does that look like? We could decouple them and move one forward faster mm -hmm. than the other, um, but there's, there's a number of other responsibilities that staff are working through and, and resourcing that is also an, mm -hmm. a, a bit of a, a hindrance. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think that idea of decoupling, like I just think the new buildings, like having something set yeah. to capture all the stuff that is coming, potentially it could be the most bang for the buck. Um, and then the other one, which is there's a lot of considerations, uh, could be something that could, um, yeah. uh, you know, go in full time to make sure everything else is considered. There's tricky time right now too. It's just like, I think we're going to notice a pullback on, uh, not, maybe not a pullback, but around sustainability considerations, just like the 
cost es escalations that are happening right now. It's like, I mean, the sustainability of the structure is catching up market-wise, but it, uh, people are freaking out a little bit in terms of the cost. Of there are times right now, yeah. absolutely. Um, one more. Yeah, one more question. Yes, please. So, if we build a building that is not carbon neutral, right, then we have to reduce its carbon and the carbon of all the other buildings that are already built. So we're adding to the problem, not less. Which is sort of the reason why we had targets years ago, and we didn't even get close to meeting. And we blew past them like there's no tomorrow, right? So my concern is, 2030 is not that far away. That's it, doesn't matter to me. But the problem is, are we not going to meet it? So if we're building buildings that aren't carbon neutral, then we not only have to deal with that carbon, we have to deal with all this other carbon, which is way past where it should have been to begin with. So that's my concern. Like, like it should, we should have polish that you can't build any buildings less carbon neutral. Figure it out, right? and, and is that an option? Yeah, that's that's one thing that that staff is looking at. That these are where we're going with with new construction. This is where the province is going. Is that where we want to be for our new construction? Is to be carbon neutral. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, would it make sense from this committee, if people think it's a good idea, to recommend staff to look at the option of decoupling? The, the green, the new building green policy update from the <laughs> energy conservation energy conservation policy. policy <laughs> yeah, um, is that is I, that something that I don't you know. know if that needs a direction. I guess I, I, is, is I'm this here for an update, just to yeah. let you know. These both of these policies were in your work plan. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't specifically move these forward together. Mm -hmm. We have just been looking at them, recognizing that there's implications and that there are opportunities um, that one can inform the other. If we were to say, um, de decarbonize all of our new buildings, then we really need to have some sort of an emergency strategy in place because we don't have any redundancy at those buildings. So. There's, there's then other considerations that go with that, that if we learn something from that process, we can then implement it into existing buildings and vice versa. So that was kind of why they've they've kind of gotten together and, and are, are moving forward together. But um, I... Mm -hmm. um, the chair. Um, would it be fair to say, Jen, that what you're doing is this work will actually come back to bring options about you know, what their choices are in terms of how yes. we see in yes. the different, I don't know, cost benefit analysis, donut economics analysis, and indicators and how that rolls out. And so I think that with my understanding of the way this is going, that will provide the opportunity once they've done that research and you've got um, a more finalized version of what Jerome was talking about with the different options and mm -hmm. considerations. Do you lay that out for council? then you then have a choice about timing, phasing, priorities, mm -hmm. and what the implications are. I, I'm just asking. This all just sounds like items that go in action plans, mm -hmm. basically, right? Yes. Or at least are the basis Correct. for the exactly. action to action plans. Exactly. So and where you look at what you want You'll have activities. to revisit them. Mm -hmm. Somebody will at some point yeah. through the action plans. But mm -hmm. those would be like top yeah. of the list yeah. items that then guide where you're going to do. Yeah. Great. Wait, hold off and make any decisions right now. Okay. Uh, seeing no more questions, um, thank you so much for the update thank on you. this and all the good work. It sounds like you're right in the thick of it. So. <laughs> it's complex. Pulling a lot yeah, in the mind. Yeah, no, I appreciate yeah. the depth of understanding. So thank you. Yeah, excellent. Thank you very much. And then you may not wish to run away because I'm, I'm just going to take a seat good. over here in the corner. <laughs> as you may I am answer. very interested. Yes. Um, brings us to 7A, uh, BC Step Code Low Carbon Energy System Implementation. Uh, and that is being presented by. So, Lisa? through the chair, I'm going to introduce Dave. Dave. Stuart will be presenting this, but this is a.
this is a point where we will be asking for a recommendation to go through to council. And what Dave will outline is we've been given the heads up of some anticipated changes to the DC step code and building code anticipated for December of this year. We think we have enough of a heads up of the direction the province is going that allows us to get ahead of it in terms of engagement and preparation of the industry for anticipated requirements as of 2024. Um, this also will mean that we need to look at our Schedule D. So what we're, what staff are essentially asking is, do we have your go ahead, as we explain this, to start advancing that work ahead of the province actually confirming what the gift is as a point. So without too much further ado, I'll turn it over to Dave to lay that out. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Lisa, and through the chair. Um, I'll just try and share my slides here. Um, And are you seeing actually? So are you seeing, I'm just checking here, are you seeing the full screen or the presenter view here? Full screen. Perfect. Excellent. Got it on the first try. Um, so yeah, today is uh, building day at the Environment Committee. Um, excellent for Jen to present first because we're going to be talking about some similar themes here. Um, Really, Jen's presentation was obviously focused on corporate buildings. I'm going to be talking about uh, how we want to go forward and some options for regulating new builds for community. And we are only talking about new builds today as well. Uh, so just a bit of a reminder and a background for the members of the committee. So I think most of the committee is probably familiar with the BC Energy Step Code, which was introduced in 2017, pardon me. That's a tiered approach, and it was really intended to replace uh, other energy efficiency standards that were um, referenced to municipal codes, including LEED, uh, Built Green and Energy Guide. Uh, that, and it's really intended to regulate energy efficiency, it was originally brought in as a uh, voluntary compliance path with the intent to slowly bring it in regulation through municipal bylaw as well as the BC Building Code. Um, the city created an implementation strategy that was endorsed in 2018. Um, following that, in 2019, as part of that implementation strategy, we uh, started awarding additional density for the higher level tiers in the STEP code through our density bonusing schedule. So that awards points to developers um, among a number of different categories. One of them is energy efficiency. If the developer meets a certain number of points, then they can build a slightly larger building or a much larger building, depending on how many points they get. Um, and then following that, in 2021, we introduced the step code rezoning policy, which means that anybody who is required to rezone for their project needs to either meet a higher level of step code or for the first time ever, we introduced what's called the low carbon energy system path in which we introduced a greenhouse gas intensity target, which Jen talked briefly about. I'll get into a more detail because that's really going to be a huge focus of this presentation, but that's essentially a carbon reduction path. But before I get into GHGI, I just wanted to remind folks what the step code's all about here in a little bit more detail. So step code's really divided, um, and a lot of what we're going to talk about is based on part nine buildings, which is generally single family dwellings and smaller, primarily residential buildings and part three, which is larger and more complex building, whether it be wood frame, multifamily or commercial um, buildings. So in terms of part nine, which is what we have, see the most in terms of the city of Nanaimo, um, these steps are, there are five steps. And so the steps five and four, which we're really getting towards a net zero ready path by 2032, as again, Jen mentioned, probably, those are where we get either there or close to that point. Um, where the lower steps are here in part three. We are already on part step three here at the city of Nanaimo as a requirement, and that's, I'll speak to it later, but that's where the province is heading by the end of this year as well. And in terms of part three buildings, so the upper, there's only four steps here. Uh, upper steps and lower steps will change a little bit based on building type. So the example that you see here on the screen, that's for a, a wood frame multifamily residential building. Um, it's pretty much a slightly different for commercial, but the same four steps. And again, we are, are we are at part two here for that. So the 20 to 
uh, efficiency improvement for uh, wood frame at multi-story. So again, the term GHGIs got thrown around earlier in the previous presentation and I mentioned it. So what does that mean? So that's based on what it translates to is greenhouse gas intensity. And that represents the typical amount of emissions per unit of area of a building. So we look at the size of the building and, and how much emissions that building's producing and then factor it down to the square meter. And when we're talking about emissions, we're talking about carbon dioxide equivalent, which is not only CO2, but other greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that's uh, what the province is recommending, what others have noted is that measurements quite suitable for, for larger or medium sized buildings, not as good for smaller buildings where it might be better just to talk about the total greenhouse gas emissions for the building itself. And the other thing I just really want to emphasize, and we'll show this more on the next slide, but where GH, GH or sorry, greenhouse gas targets or GHGI really differs from step code is step code is really more about energy efficiency, reducing the energy requirement of the building in terms of greenhouse gas. It gets there to some degree, but not nearly as much as actually having uh, GHG targets. Um, and, to, and that goes back to the electrification conversation as well. So I'll show that in one second here. So this is a chart. It was done by a gentleman by the name of Brandon McEwen, who's part of the some of the same networks that we are in terms of the electrification networks and step code, BC Step Code Council. Uh, and he works for AES Engineering. So I just wanted to give him some credit because I really like this slide. And what this shows here is um, even in a step five building, which is a net zero building pretty much, if the primary heat source and hot water source is gas, you're looking at a greenhouse gas intensity of four, which exceeds our, our level three for our rezoning policy. Um, however, if you flip down on the bottom of the chart or you're looking at an all electric building, which is the green little greenhouses there on the chart, you're looking at a less than uh, two, close, basically a one in terms of GHG intensity just for a step two building by going electric as opposed to natural gas. So it does show that really in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, the heat source is really, really what matters. The Just if anyone's curious, the little um, light greenhouse in the middle, that's electric heat pump. So that makes a slight difference there if you go from baseboard or some other electric to a heat pump. So up until recently, um, the city, however, hasn't been able to really require any sort of greenhouse gas targets in a building bylaw. So as I mentioned, we do do it in our rezoning policy where it's an option for, for developers, but we don't require it. Um, and developers can even then still choose to implement a higher step code. So as Lisa Popolsing mentioned, we the province is looking and has given us the heads up that they're looking to update the building code. The timeline for that they're looking at is December of this year. Um, so a couple of things are happening. They are looking to go to step three for part nine buildings and step two for part three, which would catch them up with where we're at as a city. They're also looking at optional GHG targets for our local governments, which basically goes back to how step code was brought in originally in 2017, where the province said, here's a set of targets that you can do, um, similar to it's a tiered system and you can choose to adopt it at your own path in terms of what levels you want to require, if, if any at all. So they've identified like a similar tiered system again for GHG targets. And they've identified a number of different paths to based on the type of building. So we're looking at GHGI. So again, measuring per square meter for the larger commercial and multifamily buildings. And we're looking at uh, base GHG for, for and GHG targets, both for part nine buildings, as well as a third prescriptive path, which is basically decarbonization and, and electrification. And I'll get into those three shortly. We also, like I said, it's a tiered system, again, similar to step code. Um, way to read this slide is as you go down the list, um, the less GHG emissions, basically. So looking at option one would be simply to measure only. So that would just require um, a builder or developer to really just measure what their GHG emissions are. And the intent there is to build that knowledge and capacity 
So similar to step one and step code, which was really just to get the blower door test. We don't care what the result is. We just want you to do it and have to start thinking about it and build that capacity. Um, step two is a medium carbon. Um, so this is basically the way the province described it. This would require decarbonization of either the heating or the hot water system. Uh, fairly higher numbers, higher than our rezoning path, uh, but just to get some level of decarbonization there. And those numbers we'll get into in a little bit, and they are going to vary by use. And then the low carbon path, which will require decarbonization of both the heating and the hot water system. And finally, the, the zero carbon ready. Zero carbon ready is, means basically either zero carbon as of now or electrification, which would be zero carbon ready when um, the PC Hydro gets to a 100% clean energy grid, which as Jen, I think mentioned, they plan to do by, I believe it's 2030 or 2050. So in terms of what those targets are for part three buildings, again, we're looking at GHGI. So they're going to vary based on use type, and that's really is based on the province's modeling. So you see at the bottom here, hotel has a higher number, and that's simply because, like you said, you heard earlier, pools and other type of uses just are more have a higher energy demand, so it's much tougher to meet those targets. Therefore, they're a little bit higher for those types of uses. Um, but really, what I want to highlight on this slide as well is uh, offices have a or sorry, pardon me, that, that number right in the middle there on low that in red, that's, that matches our rezoning policy and is generally achievable with uh, electric heat and hot water. In terms of part nine, um, a little bit more complex. So apologies if I lose you and I'm happy to take questions. But basically what there is the province is starting with is a cap or a base allowance. Or, um, which is you, ideally they recommend for small homes. We should generally be able to meet this, but what that is is the kilograms of CO2 equivalent per unit, per building that that unit can meet. So again, no, you're looking at the numbers there and they vary based on the, the tier. However, I, for if you can't meet that base allowance, you still have options. And that's where we get into the next slide here. So where a, a builder or developer can't meet that cap, they then have to do whichever emits less total G. So they either have to look at a, a GHGI target here on the left-hand side or a maximum cap. So again, we're looking at, in this case, looking at measuring for the whole building itself as opposed to on a square meter basis. The maximum cap, they, their modeling suggests works better with, for larger homes, whereas uh, GHGI works really well for medium-sized houses. And last but not least, uh, the other option, again, similar to step code for those that know step code or remember, when step code came in, it had step codes primarily a performance-based path, and, and a, meaning that the building needs to meet certain performance standards as opposed to prescriptive, which means it needs to meet certain written key standards but it did have a prescriptive path as an option as well. Uh, the GHGI targets the provinces are looking at bringing in will also have a prescriptive path. We don't know exactly what that's gonna look like, but what they're suggesting is the medium level target would be a decarbonization of the heat only, whereas low target would be decarbonizing both heat and hot water and zero carbon ready, fully decarbonized building. So unless there's questions here, I'll jump to what the what it looks like for Nanaimo. Dave, can I ask you a question? Yeah, through the chair, I'm happy to take questions. Um, when you say fully decarbonized building, that does not include the building itself, like the construction of the building, correct? It's just the consumption of energy once built. Yeah, excellent question. Yeah, we're not looking at embodied emissions okay. in this. This is just the use of the building once it's a step, once it's built. And then my other question is, the first two steps seem really low. Like, it doesn't really take that much. I'm surprised that, you know. For step code or for the decarbonization? For that, that previous slide, whatever the new, the new code's gonna be, if that's considered low, that's really surprising. Like, meeting that bar is not that hard. A hot yeah. water heater and a heat pump. And water no heat furnace. Those. And yeah, that seems like excessively low as a, <laughs> as a yardstick <laughs> compared to the other one, which is, 
Anyway, sorry. That's not, I mean, that's just, I guess, where it is, but. It's the main heat source of the house. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry, Dave. No, that's okay. Yeah, I'm not sure I, there was a question there, but in terms of, yeah, I can comment on it anyways. I guess uh, my question yeah. is, my question is basically that if the city was to say there's no more natural gas in construction, you've met that, you've met that almost entirely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the challenge for that is, is as we're, we're waiting for what the actual regulations will say, whether we have the authority to say that or not. The other way of basically saying that without saying that, however, would be to implement a, a low GHG requirement. So if you have something like three or less, you're basically saying you need to decarbonize. Right. Um, so that's it's just a, and that's what we're looking at here. And it's a good segue into the next steps for Nanaimo is how we get there. Um, in terms of, yeah, I agree. Some of those numbers seem quite high or, or low, depending on your how you look at it. In other words, they, they don't seem like they'd be that difficult to meet. Uh, keep in mind, this is provincial regulations and, and a path for what the province is trying to do is, is create something for every single community in BC to sort of pick up and grab where they think they're, they're at in terms of capacity wise. So a community in the north that's maybe a little more natural gas dependent and has higher heat requirements and hasn't implemented a low carbon energy system in a rezoning policy like we have, maybe needs to go to uh, this, you know the level one there um, where maybe we have, might have more capacity. And that's what we're, we look to, we're looking to find out as we prepare for the consultation. So really that's look at where we're looking at right now is um, we're looking for direction to start doing that prep work and start doing, continue on that, that path for ho the homework. Then in early 2023, when they, um, we have a little bit more clarity on what those regulations are, um, we'll look to go out and do some consultation. And later in 2023, um, we're hoping within the year to have a building bylaw amendment ready to go to, to the council, as well as we also realize that our Schedule D um, density bonusing, which right now references various levels of step code, uh, is probably going to become a very out of date. It's already a little bit out of date in that it, we reference additional points if you go two steps forward and then you get another two points if you're a net zero building. Right now, if you go two steps forward, you are a net zero building. Um, so we're looking at some changes to that as well as our looking at if our rezoning policy, which again, um, either requires a low carbon energy system or a higher step code, if that needs to be changed or up to, uh, whether we need to eliminate that or update that to an even stricter standard if, if we bring in um, a low carbon energy system as of right in a bylaw, in a building bylaw, pardon me. So that's kind of what we're looking at for Nanaimo in terms of a timeline of where we've come from, just to sort of summarize this timeline sort of, so basically we're looking at what the province has done in terms of um, both step code and GHG and the city. And then we'll look to, and then the previous slide kind of looks to the future. So I think I kind of mentioned step code came in in 2017. We brought, started implementing it in 2018 looked at a number of policies going through 2019 to 2021 with the rezoning policy. And now uh, as of this year, we've, we've updated to step three and step two for part nine and part three. And now we're looking at uh, consulting on GHG targets and bringing those in in 20, next year. Whereas the province is looking at um, meeting a zero carbon target by 2032. Pardon me, that says 2030, it should be 2032. Uh, so, any questions on that? Uh, thanks. Um, also, um, if I remember correctly, we're also looking at Schedule D for uh, housing uh, it, uh, incentives. Um, will this be coming to Council as all one big package, or are we doing it twice? A fantastic question. And honestly, we haven't um, had those conversations with current planning at this stage yet. I imagine as of right now, and Lisa Popal can certainly weigh in on this, uh, the Schedule D conversation will more likely be linked in with the building bylaw policies and the rezoning policy just as a one package in terms of how we regulate energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions in new builds. Whereas, like you said, the uh, the other Schedule D amendments maybe are related to other 
parts of Schedule D, like the sustain, or sorry, the social pieces there. So at this point, I think it would make, in terms of consultation, they'll be certainly separate, whether they come at the same time or not. I'm not sure what their timeline is. But. On that same point of consultation, we went to the business community quite a few times in the last couple of years. Um, and specifically when we were introducing our new step codes, we went to the business community and they fully knew that four and five was coming. So are we incorporating some of that or are we starting from scratch in terms of consulting with the business community? Yeah, so through the chair, I'll, I'll start. Um, absolutely, I think we have an op we have a base here where we, we're, we're in a different place than we were in 2017 where um, the builders are aware of step code. We have done quite a bit of consultation. We're also looking at, I forgot to mention, working regionally with the RDN and some of the member municipalities on consultation through this, uh, as well as doing our own consultation. But in terms of one thing that is new to, will be new to them is the GHG requ requirements. Um, and the GHGI requirements have, we have not had that conversation with them at, with the builders at, a level of building policy yet. Certainly they're aware of the rezoning policy or, sh or should be at this point, but that, that level of consultation hasn't happened yet. Cool. Quick question, Dave. I'm just trying to send the numbers. The values of the numbers that are in the tables. These are estimates or model numbers assuming efficiency of a house or are they actual derived from, actually derived from measured emissions for a specific size of house? See what I mean? It, I'm not sure which table you're referring to. Um, um, I guess your part nine, uh, the base allowance, for example. Yeah, so that's total kilograms of CO2 equivalent within the house. So for the entire house, that's where it differs. Because that's why, because the numbers differ. But GHGI is per square meter, whereas this is just total kilograms per unit for the, emitted to the house. And I believe that's on a yearly basis. I so how do we know these numbers? That's based on modeling from the province. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And how does Nanaimo own those numbers? Uh, good question. In terms of where we're at, so this is based on new builds and construction. So we uh, that's going to be part of the question is, um, so basically what they're saying, the province is saying is if you have a step three building that is primarily electric, this, this is going to be a fairly easy target, but it is going to vary based on the, the type of house. Um, and, and more importantly, the heat source they use. So we don't know those numbers for each individual house. We have a pretty good idea based on certain so building they, archetypes. Those are estimates different. based on an understanding of the, the step three, the construction regulations and what you can reasonably you know, not lose in terms of energy in the house and, and a particular prescribed heat source. I mean, it says nothing about how people behave in terms of using the energy, right? No, yeah, this is, and it's based, and these, these, first of all, these aren't numbers, these are, are they're, they're targets, right? So yeah. that they, someone has to meet. So it's not, they're based on estimates and it's based on modeling. Yeah, so you could have a house that's modeled to meet these targets and pass, but if somebody decides to open all their windows and crank the heat the, in January or whatever, then yeah, they're going to exceed that, GHG level, or they put enough natural gas furnace for, for whatever reason afterwards. That's that's goes to what Jen said: the complexity of existing buildings, and not something we can control at the building permit stage. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. One more question. Yeah. Did you have your? No, she just said. Um, Dave, um, is the city allowed or uh, uh, allowed legally to require that new buildings have a sticker on them that says it's to this step coder, the GHGI is this. And not unlike when you see, when you buy a refrigerator, it's got a little sticker on it. Um, and because I'm, I'm always of the opinion that shaming developers into building better buildings, um, and, and, and I believe that an ed, the education component of it, like most people look at a sticker on the fridge and know what it means now. Um, so can we do the same thing and require builders that when you sell a house, it has to have a sticker right on the door? says this house produces this much carbon? Yeah, there's definitely been talk of that at the provincial level in terms of building benchmarking, not just for new builds, but also for 
for real estates when or realtors when they're selling a building is requiring um, energy labeling. So I, that's something where the province is going in terms of legal requirements. To be honest, I'm not sure where we're at with that, but that's certainly something that we're looking into at the staff level. We've joined a building, actually we just did a press release today that went out, a uh, joint press release with uh, Building Benchmarking BC where we've joined on as a partner with them. So that's something that, yeah, we're absolutely heading that direction. Um, it, both that's again, largely for, for sale, but as well as new builds. So. If we're not there already, we, that's some place I see us getting there in the near future. Yeah, thank you. Through the chair, thank you, Dave, for mentioning the building benchmarking, which is a project that uh, we're undertaking to encourage. Now, Dave, am I correct? This is targeting our larger buildings that are, have a higher proportion or risk of being energy inefficient and getting voluntary sign up so we can monitor not just somebody can as they said, build a building but then if their operation is poor they change things so it allows us to monitor over time and then so you could get your sticker but then you could operate your building quite poorly and make amendments and this is a way of us monitoring that and tracking regularly and, and Dave just to confirm my understanding is benchmarking starting with the larger office more complex buildings multifamily uh, rental building and so forth and so people would be able to go online and say hey if I buy in this building rent in this building here's what the carbon um, footprint looks like is that correct yes that's correct Lisa thank you yeah and there, there's a, I'm probably mixing two different programs here um, so yeah in terms of building benchmarking and I think the other report piece that Lisa said is that's as of right now an optional path um, mm -hmm. the other piece that's in the works I mentioned earlier with the province is um, and building labeling at the real estate end. So that again would be at the point of sale requiring uh, real estate agents or homeowners to list the ener the ener guide rating of their home or the, yeah. But again, that's in the works. Uh, I don't have enough information to present on that any, any further, but that's definitely something that is being talked about at the provincial level. So if I may, uh, was that a yes or a no that the city has the legal authority to require new buildings that have a sticker on them? At, at this point, it's an I don't know. It's, we'll look into it, but it's certainly something that's, uh, I, I think the answer was, I don't know at this point, but I, I see us working towards that rate. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll follow up and get back to the to the committee on, on the next meeting on that one, if but not those sooner. Those would only be valid and shaming up to the time when the new step code kicks in. Like only for those two, if you're trying to get ahead of, mm -hmm. then that, there's a shelf life of that sticker of two, three years or whatever it is, five, eight. Because at some point that just becomes your new norm, right? Yeah. And your sticker is just, yeah. Great. Um, I've got a quick question uh, just around the uh, engagement and consultation uh, with the uh, builders and community. Um, in that process, I imagine, is, is there a certain amount of uh, education and information giving uh, in that uh, consultation process? And then it, primarily kind of figuring out what different barriers are and considerations are in terms of the policy development? Sorry, can you repeat the question? I think it's just my computer here. I didn't catch the oh, first no, no, part no of that. Can, can yeah. you hear me clearly right now? I can, thank okay, you. Okay, cool. Um, in the consultation process with um, builders and community, uh, will there be a large amount of sort of education and information giving just sort of on, you know, where the province is going, what our goals are, what's needed to be accomplished, along with uh, identifying barriers uh, and challenges and considerations, you know, in the policy development? Is that kind of the, the primarily the the uh, intent of the consultation? Yes, through the chair. Well, you are the chair. Uh, in a word, absolutely. Um, that's, uh, yeah, so in terms of the engagement, I think it would be largely two-pronged, but the first and probably foremost would be exactly what you mentioned, the, the education piece on where the province is going. Um, again, similar to what we did with Step Code, where I think the message was, the province is going there anyways. We want to give you build, help you build the capacity to get there. 
early and, re and ready. So that's, again, that will be the messaging in terms of where the province is heading, how you achieve this, um, what resources are out there. But then there'll be another part where we listen in terms of what's your capacity, what are you doing um, already now to, to meet these goals, what will be some of the challenges in terms of uh, meeting these proposed greenhouse gas targets the province are proposing. So, but yeah, absolutely. Again, education will be key to this. And, and in, that, in that process, like say if, you know, the, the province is going to be coming out with a certain um, plan of implementation and, and regulation, um, you know, if we're, we're going out doing our consultation, uh, say we identify things like, you know, there's going to be the added cost or if there's added cost, but say like, you know, we have a huge shortage in actual skilled people that can do the work of installing whatever systems that are there. One, are we able to feed that information back to the province? And two, can we get in a position where, you know, say we, we, we identify certain gaps and maybe it's like, you know, we require support or, or partnership with VIU to, to, to provide some necessary resourcing or what, whatever thing, maybe it's something to help in a certain supply chain issue or, or whatnot. Um, are, can those be added approaches to our policy development or would that be like a, a side on a, a side program or whatever on top of our, our policy implementation? Yeah, in terms of absolute, first of all, absolutely that we can and will do a lot. So to use the example you said, if we hear back related to provincial capacity or anything that the province needs to hear. Um, both Ting and myself attend a, a step code network, uh, which is peers from other local governments, as well as representatives from BC Hydro, um, the BC building, I uh, can't remember the name of the facility, but the folks that are responsible for the building code, um, all attend that, that meeting. So that's something where exactly that happens, where we pass on what we heard from other builders during consultation, what we're hearing from our councils um, and others in terms of where we're at in capacity wise. So absolutely we can do that. In terms of whether we want need to codify that into policy or, or simply just do it, that's probably going to depend on what level that is. I certainly uh, that feedback and those challenges are going to influence whatever wherever we arrive in terms of our recommendations that we'll bring back to this committee. So for example, if we do hear that there are large capacity issues and we're just not there yet, we may need to consider a, a less aggressive approach. Um, so that's going to be part of the, those, or we may look at, like you said, a policy on whether that's a partnership with BIU or to use the step code as an example. When we looked at when step code first came out in 2017, we implemented a, a rebate for home energy audits. And one of the reasons for that, quite frankly, was to help build the capacity of home energy advisors in Nanaimo. Mm -hmm. So we had those folks, not just to, to look at existing builds, but that there would be enough home energy advisors out there to, to meet step code for new builds. So again, that's when we start looking at that, we may be developing side policies to, to support this program as, through that consultation. And that's that's a large part of why we want to get started on this early. Great, yeah, yeah. I guess like um, that's that's wonderful, and I and I think like you know in the framing going out to uh, builders and that, um, and in just sort of how this thing is like partly it's like sort of like economic development. Like say you know I mean Vancouver and Victoria are, are, are pretty far ahead, but the more people they have trained and the capacity to to put in this type of infrastructure and, and building. You know, there's this way that the province is going to mandate it happening, and the more people in our community that have those skills, one, we can do the work here, and two, you know, we can be able to expand and you know assist, say, Campbell River or or you know folks up in, in Parksville and other communities that may not have the same type of resourcing, much that Victoria and Vancouver do here. But just uh, some thoughts, but great. Uh, any other questions for Dave? I have one. Yep, Jerome? I have a question about the motion that you have or the statement that you have. Um, when I hear you, Dave, when I see the numbers and when you explain these things, I wonder why words stop at the step codes. 
Like I've, I've talked to energy advisors and say, you know, in this region, given the climate, it doesn't take much to, if you have a new build and you put solar panels, you get close to net zero very easily. Uh, why, step, why stop at step, if you're going to go through this process, why not go even further? Sure, deal about the, the upcoming step code, which is just already kind of in the pipeline, but why not just sort of think bigger and ask the developer, if you to talk to builders, what about going for something even bigger? Since, since you're just going out there to kind of feel the waters <laughs> and see what they're thinking and how complex it would be, because it's... You know, so are you drove just in terms of the language. So implementation of the steps of the BC energy yeah. step code and greenhouse gas emissions targets for new Right, buildings. so those two things refer specifically to those two metrics that are yeah, in the chart. And I'm thinking, yeah. why not just broaden it? You include yeah. those two, but you can say, okay, why don't you just have a discussion about what can we do to make buildings as energy efficient as we can from mm -hmm. all standpoints of energy mm -hmm. efficiency, not just the step code, not just the greenhouse gas emissions equivalents, just mm -hmm. the whole system. So what things do you think would be, current. what do you yes. think would be missing? What what specific things would be missing? So this is about uh, use. So you could add. So there's another metric, which is a net zero idea, which you're, you're consuming as much as you're producing, which implies solar panels. That's yet another way of measuring efficiency. It's not in that language, but I'm wondering why not just put all those things all at once, like have the full discussion around those things. Dave, did you have any thoughts on on that? Yeah, I do. Thanks, Chair. Um, so in terms of, yeah, the metrics, uh, thank you. Good questions by the Chair as well. Because, yeah, um, in terms of energy efficiency, the province brought in step code as the energy efficiency measure. It does include net zero. Net zero is the top step of step code. Um, and net zero can be achieved not only through solar panels, but can also be achieved through electrification with uh, as the grid goes to a fully uh, clean electric grid, or pardon me, electric grid, uh, carbon neutral grid. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I think in terms of that, they, they can can be achieved through step code or GHG um, targets. Those are the metrics the province are giving us in terms of the local government powers for energy efficiency and GHG reduction. Um, in terms of where we go on those those two scales, that's what the consultation is okay. is really going to be about. But we, we we can aim high through that consultation, absolutely. Okay. And through the chair, I think an important point through this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, is that we get to have a conversation about, okay, through the code, we're allowed to require this, but what can we send you to do beyond that? Right. And I think that's an important other piece that I think you're building in and that we're, we want to consider as part of Schedule D. Because right now, Schedule D, what we're uh, options and incentives are now requirements, but we can step it up right. again. So I, 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 we're, I think we're hopeful, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave, that we will address that um, where we don't have the power to require, we have the power to incent. Incentivize. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and just to clarify, yeah, so in terms of energy efficiency, that's that's going to be step code or, or GHG target. In terms of other pieces, that yeah, absolutely. Um, we can incent through Schedule D, uh, and we, we can, and we already do, and we'll continue to have those conversations, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, in, in theory, I, following up on what Jerome was saying is, there's a next level past step five that we should be talking about. I think it's in the it's, top it's step. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, like, because um, in the what we'd like to do is build build buildings that are actually carbon no, negative. Sure. Yeah, exactly. Or negative. Yeah. Negative, right. right? Yeah. So, uh, I think that's, that's a conversation that we should be having because. It's one of these things, okay, we're going to do all this thing, we're going to be here, we're all at step five, now what? Right? Uh, yeah. But the line yeah, in terms of the level change. beyond step five, sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, in ter I mean, step five, again, is carbon neutral. Um, in ter I guess the next level would be actually producing energy back onto the grid. Yeah, that's... Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, in terms of the recommendation, are, are folks happy with this recommendation? And maybe we should put it on the table and move it on. Move the recommendation. Moved by Don. Do a seconder. Sure. Jerome. Um, motions on the table. Any questions or discussions with the motion? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Dave. 
big, big thank you and Lisa and everybody working on this, uh, getting this moving forward. And um, yeah, see, see where, where we, can, we can take it and, and push things as, as far as we can push them. And uh, yeah, so thank you for putting these recommendations forward and uh, calling the vote. All in favor of the recommendation? Opposed? Recommendation carried. Great. Thank you. Um, that brings us to feedback RE future committee operations. So this was something that I put on the agenda um, and Don and you know in conversation with staff and just we're nearing the, the end of this council's term and um, in that process uh, there will be a new council in October. Uh, there may be some returning members um, but it would be good to get some feedback from the committee in terms of defectiveness of how things were structured, um, what elements could be improved in this, in, in how this committee operated, um, what elements um, should be in the committee's mandate and, and whether, you know, what, what we're being presented and asking feedback on was, was a useful time for committee members and anything else you, you want to share. And this will kind of start the, the conversation uh, about this. Uh, which you know we'll potentially revisit at the next committee meeting in September with a bit more structure to it. But I just I really wanted to open up the floor to to hear folks' initial thoughts and yeah, how, how is this in terms of a productive use of your time and is this what you're hoping you know to be focusing on and, and what the sh city should be focusing on? So um, hope that gives you enough for for some feedback and so we'll open it up for questions and uh, discussion and feedback. So I'm looking up to the, the digital cloud uh, to begin this conversation. <laughs> Harvey, Lisa, do you have any in initial thoughts? And uh, we can also take more time to, you know, put this out there so that we're more prepared for the discussion next uh, meeting. Well, you're asking me. I found yeah. it. I found it quite interesting, personally myself, to, to keep my interest in it. Um, found it hard to uh, follow at times. To, to keep track of it, it was. Uh, you know, I wish I could have part participated more. But um, you guys were beyond my participation a lot of the time. But I appreciated being involved. That's about all I can say at this point. Okay, great. No, it's something to, to take note on, just sort of uh, level of participation and sort of accessibility in, in, into the, the conversation and, and tracking what was going on and, um, you know, I think maybe we can tailor some, some more questions to, to delve into that a little bit more, you know, in the, in the next meeting. And, uh, you know, please jump in as more stuff comes to you, you know, even in the next 10, 15, 20 minutes while we're having the discussion, please uh, just raise your hand and add more. All right. Thanks. Lisa, anything coming up for you initially? Um, I have to echo the comments. I wish I could have um, at times participated more, but uh, I've appreciated the notes ahead of time and getting the opportunity to to read all that over and prepare myself as best I can for the meetings. I think that it was obviously really challenging not having the meetings in person um, because I really did enjoy the those meetings that we had when they were in person. And so um, Looking forward to getting back to a little bit of that again. I also very much appreciated the opportunity and I, I appreciate, you know, this question um, and would probably like some time to take what you've said into consideration and give some more feedback. Absolutely. Thanks, Lisa. 
Who made the bells online? Wally was here before, but I think he's gone. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Alright, draw your turn. My turn? Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I think it's like I've gone like from every end of the spectrum. So there have been times I've found it really... Well, the whole process has been interesting because I didn't appreciate the complexity of you know, what goes on. That's one thing. Um, and sometimes I found it very efficient. Sometimes I found it very inefficient for a bunch of different reasons. Um, I think in terms of efficiency in these meetings, I would certainly appreciate way less PowerPoints being read to me because I can read those ahead of time and appreciate way more time talking about what's on the PowerPoints. Then. So, um, yeah, I think the value of the committee is in the discussion, not, you know, so we can all read what's on there. We can all come up with questions. So, I mean, Dave's no offense. They were short. That's great. You know, and they're right on the tables, but we've also had like 35 page PowerPoints. We don't, we can all read. So let's just get to the, to the substance, I think, in the meetings. Um, looking back, the two things that stick out for me right now, when I think back to the first meetings we had, I can remember how many, like three years ago now or whatever, I think in the first, First two meetings, two things that we put down on paper we wanted to do was uh, measure things, <laughs> create opportunities for the city to measure things, base the decisions on real data, uh, and I don't really know where we are in that process. I don't quite think we've gotten there. I certainly haven't really gotten there, but I don't think we've put in place the pieces that allow us to do that. So that's one thing, and so I hope that materializes in the future, and I think through the action plan, it, I find that, I have to admit that I find a plan adopted by council that doesn't include the actions that will support it, I find that surprising, but I understand why it happens the way it does, but I still find it surprising. So I'm hoping that the plans that will come will support what's been done in this, through this whole effort, because it's been a massive effort, and I think it needs to have good plans behind it, otherwise it'll be a of a wasted opportunity. Um, and then the other thing that really sticks out to me is Jennifer said this, and we've been saying this since the beginning almost, how interconnected things are. So I think it would be great if the committee and other committees create the opportunities to actually have those key discussions together. Either it's a rep from each committee or a couple of people that are interested, because you can't talk energy efficiency without talking about affordability, which comes into housing, which comes into all that other stuff. And all the discussion needs to happen. I think they kind of need to happen as a group. Otherwise, it, it, it always stays in silos. And the beauty of the beauty, or whatever, the goal of this plan was to have things connected. So it would be great if that happens. I think those are the two things right now that I can come up with. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, Don? Well, I haven't only been on the committee for a short period of time. Um, I, um, I, I think going forward, um, the idea of action plans are, are, I'm hoping, will be coming out of the committees. And in the event that I get elected again, if I, if I run again, which I probably will, um, I would like to see a committee for each of the each, each of the parts of the plan, and that is their role over the next three years is, is to flesh out that action plan. Um, it's a it's a fairly complicated subject of which I'm uh, I'm, I'm I'm hearing. And we're, and we're seeing all these PowerPoint presentations and say with all these graphs and all these metrics. Um, I'm, I'm a fellow who believes sincerely that there is a simple solution to every problem and we just make it complicated. Um, so uh, um, I think going, going forward and I guess if I, I was saying what I, I didn't really see come out of this committee is the ability to sit down at a table and start fleshing out some serious policy development. Um, mostly it's, we get policy development coming from staff and we're here to okay it, as opposed to us working together as, as a group, along with staff, to come up with policy. So uh, I understand there's probably some reasons for that, because you don't want counselors making policy, but uh, you know, because we're crazy and dangerous. But, uh, I, I think going forward, I, I would like to see that uh, happen a bit more. Great. Oh, and if I could, the very first meeting I attended, where we made all of those resolutions and all that stuff with the council, and everybody started freaking out, best meeting ever, <laughs> right? <laughs>
Great, yeah, no, I, I think that's a, it's a, that's a good initial start, and I think just having uh, some reflection on those those questions, just about your experience, what would improve your experience on the committee, and also to how what what you see the best use of a committee for achieving the goals that the city is putting out and the effectiveness of a community. There, there might be things that it just might be not effective for us to have this certain type of committee makeup on um, and a better use of um, sort of the time of individuals that are coming from the community from, from different parts of the community that might not be like in the weeds on specific municipal policy on, on aspects. Um, or to come into the policy discussion at different times. Um, but I think ultimately um, what we want to create like as a, as, a, as a city is an institution that can be responsive to the challenges that we face. So we face a, a community issue around homelessness or, or having to address uh, meeting our goals around climate emissions. How can we most effectively organize to do that in, a, in an efficient manner? and to deploy our resources in that way and you know in my experience of um this committee at times it was like it was really good use of time and, and things are moving forward and other times it may not have been the best makeup having a you know a community a members at uh at, at a committee when a lot was very detailed policy stuff that you know, it, it takes a long time to track and go through and, and understand to, to provide meaningful input on. Um, it, it's interesting, uh, at the regional district, a committee structure that they do use is sort of under larger plans. So there'll, there'll be a plan created, like we kind of did with the, the city's uh, climate adaptation and our climate mitigation sustainability plan, which is, was part of the reimagine process, but basically, you know, with the community and feedback from the community and input, created this plan with goals and, and strategies that will have actions. And then that's a quite a collaborative process. And then once that plan's created, there's like a, a committee. So for, for the regional district, for example, with solid waste, there's a solid waste management plan that sets goals, you know, like the regional district has a 90% waste reduction goal. Um, and then there's a list of different actions that will be implemented over a period of time to meet that goal. There's a committee that's made mostly up of, of elected officials, um, elected representatives and staff that really go through the, the, the nitty gritty of the policy and meet more regularly on aspects of those action plans that come forward um, to, to run them by uh, the committee and get approval uh, to, to be approved by the board. Um, and then once every three months or six months, there is a more a larger uh, community monitoring committee that the individuals that are on that committee have knowledge and participated in the creation of that initial larger strategy. And then that's another layer of accountability that they get updates on where things are at um, and provide feedback on certain policies. Uh, but they meet less frequency, fr frequently and provide a little bit more higher level direction. And I, I found that that type of committee structure is, can be quite effective um, and, it, uh, and, and, and has a bit, sometimes a bit more direction, um, but, but I don't know. But I think that it's important just, you know, that time that we have together is like, you know, if there's things that we can adjust and change that could make things feel that they're more efficient and effective and uh, that we you know provide that feedback so that we can um, yeah just dial things in a little bit better uh, the next go around. So I don't know if yeah staff had any comments on your experience or things that you'd like you know the, the committee to consider. Um, okay, uh, well um, through the chair I believe we also have Jeremy Holm is also online so I oh. I do have a bit of perspective because. Ting and myself and Dave are came in part way through. Yeah, in the last six months. No, maybe since January or February. Uh, so for us, it's really helpful to hear this feedback because ultimately this may guide council, the next council, on how you structure your committees. 
and our interest in it is making this um, time good feedback on the PowerPoints, by the way. Um, making this time as effective for all of you. I, I will say that I found this to be very helpful from the reimagined perspective, having this as another level of community engagement um, with experts compared to sometimes you'd have a steering committee and you'd have one person representing the apartment. And it was really helpful to have not only this committee but ACA as well, because you had a cross section of people instead of one person representing accessibility and inclusion, sitting on something. It, 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 for me, I, I did like that, um, but ultimately that's kind of up to council to decide to continue. And our other thing is, you know, how can we ensure we deliver? And I just want to thank Jen and Dave for good presentations today, ensure that we are bringing you things that are meaningful and that it is timely, and I think I've had this feedback also from Jerome, that the question you're asking about, well, this isn't something that you need to bring to us, come to us with something that we really are going to. So it's that balance we have of keeping you updated on what we're doing without, and also giving you a chance to have discussion and provide guidance to us and the council on our next steps. Um, and then the other thing is, and I think Lisa hit the nail on the head in person, is I've always enjoyed um, in person. I, I think we've done well with Zoom, um, and I think maybe we'll be Zooming for the rest of our lives going forward. Um, but my interest is also, because there's committee members with different levels of uh, technical ability, like even Jen stretches me, um, which is great, same with Tang and Dave, um, is, is part of us working with a diverse group is making our information accessible to a range of audiences and both Jen, Ting and Dave have tried quite hard to hit that and sometimes we hit the mark and we need, maybe it works well for Jerome but it doesn't work well for Lisa or and and so that's that can be a bit of a challenge is how we tier that but it's also good for us because when we go out to the community you're our testing mm -hmm. right uh, so that's one thing and the other thing is, dare I say it, would really be nice going forward to also look at the word fun. We, we deal with pretty heavy topics in some of our committees, but at the same time, for, for us as staff, we're making sure that we're dealing professionally with the information you want, but also, you know, the sky's kind of smiling at me, just like, but, you know, that there's a way that we're making it rewarding for participants. That it's, um, you're discussing heavy topics, you're discussing things you move forward, but how can we deliver an experience that is uh, professional, moving the city forward, and then bringing in you know, some dynamism to, to an enthusiasm to a serious topic, but at the same time, if we want to keep our community with us, we can't switch them off and frighten them. We've got to alarm them in a good way that they take action. Um, but, they, you know, so all of those pieces, I'll stop there, mm -hmm. but that's, uh, it's kind of our job as we communicate and engage not only internally driving different uh, interest groups internally, but also our external participants. And Dave, that psychology behind it that I think Lisa and oh, the other lady from PIU, I'm kind of, mm -hmm. thank you, uh, are very big on in terms of that influence. So I'll pause there, but uh, I have enjoyed this. Yeah. But I, I at the same time recognize the frustrations. Mm -hmm. And I do want to say that Ting, Dave, and the other members of our team are coming back to council with a monitoring strategy that's uh, actually, I'd say, three quarters baked and draft to come back um, to present um, on the indicators of monitoring and the um, technology behind those regular mm -hmm. pieces, right? Dashboards, that, that type of thing. So that work is ongoing, and then aiming to come to uh, the new council along with your options for actions. Okay. You know, here's what we see, are the gaps, what to add, um, and then every year our task will be to say, okay, this is what progress we're showing. Do we need to adjust our actions? Do you need to balance or change our budget performance? So, I'll pause there. Thank you. Cool. Great. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, Jeremy or Dave? There it is. Yeah, hi, hi uh, thank you um, 
chair for the chance to uh, to speak on this too. And joining from the screen, I actually prefer prefer in person. But uh, um, that, uh, yeah, definitely um, uh, a lot of good uh, comments and and very interesting to hear and and helpful in and moving forward with um, with this committee and then uh, whatever um, the, uh, the structure that uh, uh, council the uh, council will um, implement coming forward and uh, and going forward and I heard uh, comment around uh, maybe organizing committees around some the um, uh, sort of the uh, primary uh, the, the overarching goals of uh, reimagine and and that um, definitely would make some sense and that would leave room for I guess a committee similar to to this but uh, I guess we'll see but um, the um, yeah there's been a lot of I think uh, um, despite some of the challenges. Uh, you know, we've heard uh, some of the maybe a bit of frustration here but um i think it's it's definitely there's some highly technical uh discussion and and work and information um related to the the topics that are covered by this committee and i think um if i can think back um there there i think there was some good value added by some of the the technical experts i'm thinking back to um, when we had uh, duncan do um uh some um uh some presentation dialogue um I think I, I'm hearing more emphasis on dialogue needed, but um, I remember that being quite um, uh, quite valuable and, and uh, productive uh, work and um, also heard maybe uh, an interest in, I, th I think I've heard before too, an interest in uh, engaging with others because there's definitely overlap and impact in, in the work that's being done. You mentioned other committees as well as I think room for input from uh, technical experts like like Duncan. I think there was good value in that. So great, um, um, uh, informative. Uh, thanks for bringing this uh, opportunity up here. And, and this is very informative and I'll help will help us uh, go forward. So thanks for that. Thanks, Jeremy. Dave? Uh, yeah, thank Thank you for the opportunity to, to, to respond, Chair. Um, I'll be fairly brief, because um, I think Lisa and Jeremy have said it, what, spoken for the city quite well. Um, in terms of in-person or online, it's, well, it's nice going online, because I can cheat and look at notes. I, I too, prefer in-person. Uh, and in terms of the comment on dialogue, I agree. I'd actually like to see more dialogue. I know my material. I. Believe it or not, I don't like hearing my own voice talk that much. So definitely prefer to answer questions and have that that dialogue. So I appreciate that comment and we'll look to make that PowerPoints more engaging and, and more participatory as we go forward. So yeah, but looking forward to continuing this committee in whatever form it reforms as post-election. So great, thanks. Anybody want to add anything else uh, before we wrap up? Great, yeah, so yeah, just uh, if you wanted to, um, yeah, give us some more thought if anything else comes to mind, we'll have a little bit of time uh, at the next council meeting or the next committee meeting to, to discuss things further, but um, yeah, the points made around um, participation and, and levels of participation and accessibility uh, to, you know, the discussion um, are definitely heard and, um, yeah, and then just sort of the, the best way to structure forward. I mean, it, it is pretty cool to have a sounding board with, with the community in terms of policy development and then also the goal setting and sort of get an idea of to the degree that you, where you, where you set the threshold for, for how much effort and um, ambition that you put in, in certain directions is, is critical and needs to come, you know, be heard from the committee. And then, you know, once policies and plans are being developed and put into place, how to, to get important feedback in their development. And then once they're in place, the accountability on sort of how they're tracking um, is another element that I think, um, yeah, making sure that, yeah, it's structured in a way to, to, to optimize all those, those elements. Um, so further discussion to be had. Um, so I think that brings us to the end of our meeting today and a uh, perfectly uh, sized agenda for today. Uh, we weren't rushing to put uh, motions you know, in the last uh, 30 seconds of the meeting together, and uh, it, was, it was a good discussion. So um, I believe uh, brings us to question period. That's right, and there's no members of the 
Uh -huh. Look here. <laughs> Great. And uh, I, I was laughing about you know in person or hybrid uh, meetings because like I find like hybrid meetings weird because like you're in person, but I always find I'm like here kind of talking off in a space with like kind of a weird tone of voice and loud to make sure that I'm heard in the cloud <laughs> and it feels somewhat disconnected from the people in the room. So uh, finding that balance will be uh, interesting. Um, I quite like it when you lean forward closer to the screen so David well, can hear you better. <laughs> I don't know where the mic is exactly if it's here, but I, I find like I'm about like this angle and about this tone that I can be heard very clearly by the people in space. But uh, thanks for making the time to, to make it here, everybody. And uh, yeah, it's been pretty exciting seeing what we were able to accomplish. And you know, heard feedback that this committee was very influential in the redevelop, uh, the, the reimagined process. So it was, uh, yeah, time well spent in terms of the input given. So um, I think without further ado, uh, we can take a motion for adjournment. Don. Seconded by Jerome. All in favor? Meeting adjourned. Have a, a great August, everyone. And uh, yeah, stay out of the heat. <laughs>